It's truly a, a privilege to be here with you this morning and uh, to be able to share with you the Lord's message. Our minister, Tony, is not here um, with us uh, this morning, but uh, before he left, he, he rang me and said, bro, I, I'm going somewhere, but I would like for you to uh, share a message with the congregation, and you'll be doing it with one other brother, namely Chris, Mr. Chris Patterson, my brother and, and a soldier in the Lord. And so I said to him, let me call you back. Give me about an hour or so, let me call you back. So I, I called him back in about an hour, and uh, I said to him, sure, I'll do it, bro, on one condition. I don't share the pulpit <laughs> with anyone. No, I'm kidding. I, I really is, um, uh, it was a privilege to, to be able to, um, and an honor to be able to, uh, to be called up to share about what we are learning learning about the epic battles in our lives and also the epic battles of the past. But before I get into the message, I'd like to uh, share a, uh, a little fun bit that I, a very interesting message I received from a friend of mine. And um, hopefully it it tickles you fancy just as it did for me. So you got it. I wasn't so smart the first time around. But uh, great, amen, guys. Again, as I said, it's a pleasure to really be able to share with you this morning about the epic battles of our lives. As a fellowship, we've had the privilege of hearing and hopefully being convinced of God's power working through the epic battles involving men of godly faith. But I am convinced in my understanding that these battles were not just against the flesh, but spiritual battles. Although David fought and defeated Goliath, Daniel survived the inferno and walked out of the lion's den Ultimately, the battle we face is not against the flesh. The scriptures makes, it, makes this very clear in Ephesians, that our battles are not of the flesh, but spiritual. Although this admonishment is not vague by any means of the imagination or understanding, I would like to take a few minutes this morning to do a little bit of a dive into this incredible admonishment by God. So this morning, I want to share with you what I am convinced the underlining factor is about these interactions of epic human battles. Epic human battles. We've had the privilege of hearing Tony preach powerfully about some of these interactions. Now I think it is up to us not just to only hear the message, but also internalize it and make it a convincing part of our lives. 
I believe from the beginning the devil has plotted to destroy and obliviate our confidence. We learn this from Adam and Eve. This confidence is what I would like to, to talk with you about this morning. So what is it about this confidence that Satan has been on our case ever since we were created? It turns out it is every thing, every thing, your confidence, my confidence, our kids and their kids and every generation, he is fighting and battling with God for our confidence. If you may, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God better offering than Cain, than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as righteous. And when God spoke well of his offering, and by faith, Abel still speaks, and even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from his, this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commanded as one who pleased God. And here's it. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I repeat, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. If this is the case, then it must be vital to know what faith is composed of. What is faith? I know we use that word, bro. You gotta be faithful. It says you gotta be faithful. And I know I use it on my wife, even on my, my own self. But sometimes we get very wishy-washy about that word and it's everything hangs on it. What is faith? It says now faith is confidence in what we hope for an assurance about what we do not see. Operative word here, confidence. Confidence. To put this in context, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. Now, that's a long passage, so I won't read it all. I will, uh, I will start from uh, verse 3, okay? Uh, bear with me for a sec. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance 
is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in that last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, don't we? These have come so that the proven genuine, genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I'm going to pause there for a sec. Sorry. My computer is misbehaving a little bit here. We need to appreciate and understand why confidence in our God is so important and crucial for the human nurturing in a godly way, and so we can make godly decisions. In verse 6 and 7, it clearly states, you know, biblical faith in the context of God's plan is precious. In that, <clears throat> in part, in part, because of God's purpose for it. Grace, God has chosen to use our confidence in him as a conduit for his grace. Say that again. God has chosen to use our confidence in him as a conduit for his grace. What are we without grace? And confidence in Christ, God, is how he is able to impact our lives and subsequently people around us, brothers and sisters in a fellowship or otherwise. When I say our confidence in him, what do I mean by this? If you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, 9 to 10, It says, do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of the creator. It's a bit, a bit going on here. I want to really just allow you to unpack it in your mind, in your heart. But what, God, what, what the scripture is saying here is that from the day that you are brought into the fellowship, the day you say, Lord, I surrender my life to you as a new created entity in God's eyes, it says the goal is being renewed in the, in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Meaning, God's goal in giving you grace and renewing you is to allow him to now rebuild you up in his confidence, the way he meant for it to be in the beginning. You know, we as beings, we were created and everything else was given to us. He said, rule over everything in the, in the skies and on, this, on the earth and in between. But it is incredible 
what man and woman have become nowadays. This all, all predicated on our confidence in him. His Satan's battles against us are not to prevent us from knowing the image as God intended it to be. Dreaming with confidence as we yield to him and learn from his direction and teachings. Just like Christ said in scripture, everything I know, I learned it from the Father. And we know how confident and how, author uh, how Christ spoke out of authority. This is how God meant it to be. For you to be able to rule over the universe, could you imagine? You know, my brother and I were talking some time, and he said to me, uh, he was living, one of my older brothers, you know, he lived with his, uh, 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 his father and his stepmom, uh, and, and, the, and the father worked um, uh, with the timber company in, in, in Ghana, West Africa, on the border of Ivory Coast and, and Ghana. And uh, this was, the, at that time, the, the premier timber uh, logging company. And so they were deep in the bush deep in the bush. And so you would often hear elephants blowing at their, their trumpet and, and lions literally roaring. And this is back in the days. When I say back in the days, not back, back in the days, but if you, my brother's uh, about 46, right? And at this point, he's probably about, you know, 10, 11. And his stepmother would send him at times late at night. And, you know, it's a sad story, but it really gave me a perspective about how the human has now succumbed even to the fears of other animals roaring or blowing their trumpets to scare you. Because he tells me he went to buy something to bring to the stepmother, and, and one time he heard an elephant blow his trumpet so loud, it scared him so much. He can't remember his feet touching the ground until he got home. This is what the human has succumbed to because of our lack of confidence and authority. I know it's a little bit of a, an interesting analogy, but it is true. Could you imagine everything has been created and given to you and now you are afraid of it? And this applies even in our lives, day to day, our work, in our marriages, in our friendships, when we're afraid to say what we need to say without authority. This is important to know because Christ spoke with unwavering confidence and authority because he understood that his confidence came only from learning from God, the Father. He yielded to God, the Father, in John 14, 28. Alex, you don't have that scripture, but just a reference. In John 14, 28b, this God intended with humans as well. Did it pull up? Okay. Let me just let me just go there real quickly and read it. It reads, You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, would be you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I emphasize this because um, it is important to understand that even Christ himself, who by all means is also God, he yielded to God, the Father. And this is how God is able to infuse in him that he can say everything he knows, he knows because he learned it from the Father. 
and he could be authoritative. He could be confident in every single situation. Now, since we know that confidence is crucial in our development, in our godly way, in living a godly way, then we ought to learn to protect and build our confidence. This is the act of a true soldier in the Lord, being able to protect and build your confidence, because this is all it is about. They're going to fight for it. I'd like to share with you two quick scenarios of how we can protect this confidence in God, thereby assuring and affirming his power acting through our daily lives. You know, in the beginning, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, I won't read it all. Uh, apparently, I only have about 12 minutes, so as soon as I get to 12 minutes, something comes up and yanks me and throws me away. I got to get there. Um, in verse 8 to 10, it reads, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This seems to be normal. And they hid from the Lord. That's not normal. Among the trees of the garden. But the Lord, call, the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 11, he says, and he said, God said, who told you that you were naked? Look at the lack of confidence. This is not how to protect your confidence. Being disobedient. And particularly, not doing things according to God's timing. Now, the way we ought to be in being crafty and protecting and being skillful in in our confidence and building it. Because this is something that is not just, you know, oh, I'm be faithful. I, I, I gotta be. It, you can build this. In Matthew 28, Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 39. Then Jesus went to <clears throat> Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. We've read and heard this message, this passage, so many times. But everything is predicated on this. If we could really understand
Here Christ demonstrated to us confidence. We see he was troubled, even to the point, as he says, to death. By surrendering to God's will, our confidence is strengthened. When we surrender to God's will and teaching. This was true for David and Daniel and me and you. All the epic battles or battles because someone's epic battle is not someone's epic battle. We all come from different backgrounds, and we all, as a matter of fact, Satan customizes our battles. That we will all fight on a daily basis and throughout the span of our lives. When we pray, and stood our ground. When you have done all, when he's confronted you with your customized battle, and you have prayed, and you have shed tears, and you've done it all, at last, we must surrender to him who knows all and strengthens our, and strengthens our, our confidence when we are obedient to his teaching and direction. Thank you, and God bless. Amen. Thank you, brother, for uh, allowing the spirit there to use you to remind us of the confidence that we have in God. And as we continue looking at some of the lessons that we can learn from these epic battles that we've been looking into for the past few weeks, if just for you who may not be aware, and Doug shared a little bit about it, as a church, we've been looking at some of the epic battles that took place in scriptures, like with David and Goliath and Daniel on the lines and his three friends on the furnace. And the scripture tells us the reason why we're looking at it because the battles weren't just unique to people of that day. Every single one of us today face different battles in our lives. Amen? And if we're going to make it in this life, if we're going to be successful in our walk with God, then we're going to have to learn how to deal with the battles that we face. And so we've been looking at these battles and trying to see what are the little pearls that we can learn and hold on to to help us in our walk with God? And so, you know, our minister has been sharing those with us. And today I just want to share a couple of thoughts and some of the things that I've been learning about these battles. And hope that it will be of benefit to us. You know, the Bible tells us that every single thing in Scripture is there for our benefit. Is there to help us in every situation that we face, to help us to build faith, help us to know our God, amen? And these battles that we're looking at, they're, they're no different. That's the purpose it serves. And for the next few minutes, maybe say 10, 12 minutes, and I've asked my daughter to help me there, because you know, I tend to lose track of time sometimes. And so, um, but, for the next 10 to 12 minutes, I want us to look at some lessons that we can learn from Daniel and his three friends that can help us in our walk. And as we, many of us, we know the story. We have heard it from childhood coming up, heard it in Sunday school, we, we have heard it recently. We know the story. And as we look at the story deeply, one of the things that I realized is these men weren't special. They were ordinary men like you and I. Ordinary men and women that experience extraordinary successes in their lives. And as I look deep into it to see what it is that led to their success, one of the common threads I noticed between these men, 
between David, between Daniel and his three friends was this. Their choices. Their choices. The success that they experienced in their lives came down to this one thing. And that one thing was their choice to honor God in every situation. You see, a lot of growing up, I grew up in Jamaica. And in Jamaica, economically, it's tough, but life is nice. Okay? The food is nice. I mean, you know. But one of the things is because economically, it's so hard. We'd look on TV and we see these people in their the nice clothes and the flashy cars and, you know, this, everything just looks great. And I would think if I just get to foreign, my life will be a success. <laughs> Didn't know how I was going to get there, but lo and behold, you know, God bless me and I'm here. And uh, to my surprise, getting here alone doesn't bring success. There's more to it than that. Yes, it's cold. <laughs> but you, the choices that we make is what determines. And not just the choices we make, the choices that we make to honor God. And we see that Daniel and his friends, it wasn't easy for them. They, even though Daniel was born in privilege. What happens, just to give a little background, is he grew up, he grew up new in God. They knew about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God who worked the great miracles in Egypt to bring his people out into a promised land, land flowing with milk and honey, meaning they had it. They had houses they didn't build. They were blessed with opportunities. They didn't create things was well for them. They learned about the, that God coming up. But yet still, Daniel found himself in a situation where he was exiled. He had no country. He lost his family. His hopes, his dreams, everything was gone. He was pretty much a slave in a foreign land. And when things like that happen to you, it, it plays on your mind, doesn't it? It makes him, maybe, I can see here, him starting to struggle. And in Daniel, and the thing that differentiated Daniel, the thing that makes him and his character one where we're looking at him today is this. He didn't give in to his feelings and what was happening to him. He chose, even in that situation, to honor God. The scripture says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. And they'll, they'll bring it up here. That he was in a situation where he was being given food to eat. Food that in his heart he knew this was displeasing to God. And Daniel, it says, he determined, he resolved in his heart not to do it. Now, I want you to understand something here. I think the battle that Daniel faced in his heart wasn't just about the food. When Daniel got exiled, you know, taken to this, not exiled, but taken to this country, foreign land, lost his place pretty much, and was taken to this foreign land, Daniel had a battle in his heart that he had to face. And that battle and that decision was this. Do I continue to please this God? After all, I've been doing so much in my childhood coming. I've gone to church. I've been giving my offerings. I've been obedient to my parents. I've done everything that the law required of me, but yet still I'm here in a foreign land with foreign customs and teachings that's contrary to God. Where is this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Where are all those great things that I hear would have happened for me? Why am I? I didn't do anything, so why am I suffering? Don't we always feel like that? We come to church, we tithe, we sacrifice, we help set up chairs, we're serving children's church even though we don't want to. <laughs> we give of ourselves. And then there are expectations that we have in our lives that sometimes doesn't materialize, and we wonder, 
does God really exist for me? Why is this not happening for me? And then we have a decision to make. Why am I struggling in my relationships at work? Why am I struggling at home? Why am I struggling in these different areas of my life? And then we have a decision to make. Is did, it, did I make the right choice in following God when I did? And Daniel faced the same decision. Some of his friends, they decided to give up on this God and they just ate the food, no problem. But Daniel, deci Daniel decided in his heart that, you know what? I'm going to honor God in spite of. And so he asks that he not eat the food that was being served. And the rest is history. And the thing we learn from this is that, and if you don't get anything else from this talk today, what you have heard thus far, I want you to get this. Our success in life has nothing to do with our circumstances, but everything to do with how we respond to it. Our circumstances has nothing to do with our geographic situation, but everything to do with how we respond where we are. Amen? And if we choose to respond like Daniel did and his three friends, we'll see amazing things happen in our lives. But it's not easy to do that, is it? It is not easy to always make decisions that we know is right. You know, someone once said, whenever we face a challenge in our lives, we have three choices. We can choose to do as we feel, as our emotions are boiled. We can choose to do what everyone else does, or we can choose to honor God. What choices will you make today? You see, I believe we are all here, every one of you are here today because you want to be successful in life. You heard about this God of Daniel, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have read what he has done in scriptures. And you have heard many times over and over that what he did for them, he can certainly do for you. Amen? And it is true. But for it to happen, we got to do this one thing. We got to choose consistently to honor God. Because the scripture teaches us in 1 Samuel 2 verse 30. I'm not going to turn there because of time, but it teaches us that God honors those who honor him. God is a loving God. Yes, he is. He's a merciful and compassionate God. Absolutely. He wants to bless our life. Definitely. But unless we choose to honor him, he will not honor us. And so we got to choose success. We got to learn to choose success. We want success. God want to give it to us, but we got to choose. There are things that we got to do to get it. And so we got to learn to choose to honor God so that God can bless us. So what are some things that we need to do to learn to develop this attitude of honoring God in everything that we do? It doesn't come naturally. Because if it did, we'd all be millionaires, maybe. <laughs> we'd all be very, very successful. But we're not. We're struggling with things. And the first thing that we got to do, just three things I want to share with you that we need to do to develop our attitude of honoring God on a daily basis. And the first thing that we need to do is this. We need to get to know the Almighty God. Get to know the Almighty God. Chris, what are you talking about? I know God. I've heard about him from I was in children's school. Of course. I'm not talking about what you have heard. Get to know him intimately. Get to know God for who he is, what he stands for, what he loves, what he, what he doesn't, what, what displeases him, what pleases him. Get to know him on a personal level. As Doug alluded to and says, you know, custom made. Get to know him yourself. You can't honor someone without getting to know them. Building a relationship with them. 
You know, remember when I just met Petrina. Can you imagine? Met this beautiful woman. Could even, couldn't believe she was single. She came and started a conversation with me, and I thought, you know, she came a couple times. Well, can you imagine if every time she came to me, I was like, what's your name again? You think she would even bother with me? <laughs> you think if I forgot her birthday, or when she was talking to me, you know, I, I didn't pay attention, or she'll tell you right now, I stopped paying attention. <laughs> But you think if I didn't pay attention and get to know her likes and her dislikes and make sure that when I'm in my interacting with her, I make sure that I do those things that pleases her. So she can see me as a, a worthy potential. <laughs> Trust me, poor boy from back home, man, I pulled out all the stops. I made promises I didn't have money to keep. <laughs> Told her things I had no idea where it's going to come, but I know I'm going to do that for you because I'm going to honor you. And you're going to know it. That's how it is with God. You don't need any special teaching about how to honor God because you do it with those that you love and who you value deeply. Amen? You need no special. You know, you just know it deep with all deep down in you. And so we need to get to know our God. Because one of the things I realized that even in my interaction with my wife, wonderful woman she is. But even as you go through life, there are things that happen to you and you change. Attitudes change. Things change. And because I've gotten to know her, I know that this is just one of those seasons of life. And so it doesn't throw off our relationship to say, oh, my wife is getting this way or you know, if she snap or something and saying, oh, she getting rebellious and disrespectful and who are you talking to like that? No, I know that this is just one of those moments because I've gotten to know her. And so the first thing we need to do is get to know our God. God want you to know him. Get to know him intimately. Daniel got to know his God. And that's why he was able to make the decisions he did. Because Daniel looked and said, even though, yes, we see God in the blessings, absolutely no problem. But Daniel understood that, you know what? Even though God blesses us, he also disciplines us when we go astray. And when we're being disciplined and things are not going the way that we want, when we're not getting the things that we desire, when things are not happening for us in the timeline that we want, it doesn't mean that God doesn't us anymore or he has cast us aside and so we need to cast him aside that's what getting to know God does the second thing we need to do so that we can be live a life that consistently honors God is get to once you get to know him diligently do the things that he expects of you the scripture says in verse 8 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, it says, Daniel resolved in his heart to please God. You can know somebody but not please them. That's not a no-brainer. It's very easy. Hey, I work with you, I can tolerate you, but you know, I don't like you. <laughs> we do it all the time. But that's not what I'm talking about with God. Because the relationship will never work if that's attitude. So once you get to know him, do what pleases him. It's a Daniel resolved. That resolution that Daniel made is something that he had to, had to make consistently. It wasn't just a one time. Because challenges always come at us, amen? We're always facing challenges. This year, I'm going to be a disciple now, 30 years. Since God called me. And if you were asked me even 15 years ago, I would have told you that I was absolutely surrendered to God. A lot of things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. I'm a different person. I'm a nice guy, you know, all those things. 
But even in these last days, I'm learning that there's so much more to learn and hold on to. Because I find even at home, those battles are still raging in my heart. Some things that I realize that I haven't absolutely surrendered to. And I give you, I'll, I'll just share with you a little bit because, you know, growing up in the Caribbean, growing up in Jamaica, one of the things is, you know, they, we're big on respect. You learn to respect your parents and, other, and the elders in general. And if you disrespected an elder, they could take hold of you and give you a couple of slaps. And you couldn't report it when you go home because you'll get more, because you know you did something wrong. <laughs> and so as I grew, I grew up with that. I despised it then, I'm telling you, I despised it. But as I grew, I saw the wisdom in it. And, I, and you know what? I told my parents, thank you. Because it helped shape me to the man I am today. But then I find as I have my own family, I try to do the same thing. But the only difference is I'm not in Jamaica. <laughs> so there's uh, different rules. <laughs> and it's frustrating, you know, when you grow up a certain way and it's embedded in you. And so now I'm at home and sometimes the kids get disrespectful and I'm like, Ugh. you will respect me, you know? And to the point where I become sinful and I say things that I regret and it scars them. And it, every time we choose to go against God's word, we never win. It separates us from our children. It separates us from our spouse. It separates us from each other. It separates us from God. And I'm learning that I, yes, you know, God says we need to lead an honorable household. We need to make sure that our children respect us. But we need to do it in a way that's also honoring to God. Amen? We need to do it in a way where you're not doing things that displeases God to get it. And so I'm learning still to surrender completely. So I realized I didn't totally surrender. That there are still parts of me that I held on to and I've got to let it go. And honor God and know that God in time will honor me, even through my children, as long as I continue to love them and teach them correctly. So get to know God. And once you get to know him, hold to the things that he calls you to do. And don't don't reject it. Don't despise it. Because one of the things I realized from these passages is that the very things that look like it was going to be the demise of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the very things that God used to elevate them, to propel their lives to greater maturity spiritually and secularly. And so, if we embrace the same attitude, absolutely the same will have happen for us. And so as we continue looking at the battles, brothers and sisters, understand that God blessed Daniel because Daniel chose to honor him. Are you honoring God this morning? We have a choice. If you're not a Christian this morning, you have a choice to make. Because God is calling you to honor him. Yes, you have heard about him. Yes, you have done some good things here and there. But God is calling you to consistently honor him. And when we do that, God will honor us. Amen? And so, I want to challenge you today. Make a decision before you leave here this morning. If you're not yet a Christian, if you haven't yet been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, make a decision to res resolve in your heart this morning, to get to know intimately this God. This God who have watched over you, who have blessed you and protected your life, that you are here this morning. And who will continue watching over you, just trying to get your attention to say, love me. Get to know him, resolve in your heart that I'm going to get to know him. 
And as you get to know him, put into practice the things that he calls you to. Wholeheartedly religious every single day, no matter what. And it doesn't matter your age. Daniel was a teen. The first real teen or campus ministry started in Babylon with Daniel and his friends. God can do amazing things with your teens. Just look at Daniel and his friends. If we're a parent, we can do the same. God can do amazing things with us if we only honor him. God gives us his best when we leave the choice to him, when we choose to honor him. Surrender those things that we're holding on from our past, those things that have hurt us, those things that have scarred us, those things that has impacted us so greatly and is holding us back from being that man and that woman that God called us to be. God is saying, let it go. Honor me and I'll exalt you in time. Not in your time, but in my time. You know, Jim Elliot once said, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to take hold of that which he cannot lose. You never lose when you honor God. Amen? Let's honor God this morning.